Welcome to When Football Began Again, the podcast that takes a nostalgic look at the Premier League era. Hello and welcome to episode 14 of When Football Began Again, the podcast that takes a nostalgic look at the Premier League era. Today's show is a return to our all-time Premier League table countdown. We're up to 48th and it is the turn of Blackpool Football Club, who, at the time of recording at least, are the last of our one-season wonders in the Premier League. But what a season it was. They shone brightly, they lit up the league, they were very unfortunate to go down and the sheer drama that was going on off the field before, during and after that time has to be heard, to be believed. We cover all of that, plus the golden era of Mortensen, Matthews and Jimmy Armfield coming up with two fantastic guests very shortly. Before we get to that, thank you so much once again for supporting the show and leaving reviews and subscribing. And if you're new here and you enjoy it, please hang around. I've got lots more content. There is Ashley Ward, Brian Dean and Danny Wilson have all been interviewed by the show. We've got season reviews of the early Premier League seasons. There's lots, lots more coming up. So if you enjoy the show, please keep on supporting it and keep subscribing it and sharing it. I really appreciate it. But let's crack on with today's show. My two guests have both been on the sharp end of Blackpool's frankly unbelievable ownership of the previous decade or two. They talk about that with searing honesty, alongside remembering the best bits, the memorable games and goals that came from this season and the players who were superstars in Blackpool for that season in the sun. And Ian Holloway's men really did light up the Premier League. We're going to cover all of that. Here is Blackpool, 48th in the all-time Premier League. Joining me today to discuss Blackpool's solitary season in the Premier League and the three decades that surround it are Chris Taylor of the Back Henry Street Fans Forum, unsuccessfully sued by the former owners of our featured team this episode. How are you doing, Chris? You okay? Very well, thank you. Very well. Welcome along. And also uh, Nathan Fogg, the author of the excellent book, How Not to Run a Football Club, Protests, Boycotts, Court Cases, The Inside Story of Blackpool FC, which is about as definitive a review of the said former owners as you're likely to find. Welcome, Nathan. Uh, we, we'll, we'll start We'll start with you, Nathan. How long have you been a Blackpool fan? When did you start going to Bloomfield Road? Uh, I think my first season was 99 to 00. So like, my dad just kind of like forced me to go when I was a kid um, because we're actually from Burnley. So like both my older brothers weren't Blackpool fans. Right. So I was like his third and last child <laughs> and he's like third and last go at it. So I don't really have, I didn't really have much of a choice even though like, I definitely had some moments like getting mocked by my friends who were all, didn't even know what Blackpool was. So, like, <laughs> that's why the book is uh, very heavily dedicated to him because... I could have just supported Burnley, which is a very boring club, and kind of just do things quite well. <laughs> and like nobody writes a book about those clubs. So. Take it away from there, Chris. How long have you been going towards Blackpool? Well, do you know what? I've dipped in and out. So th- th- this is the absolute truth. Um, I know that you get some real diehard fans on here. That's not me. Right. That's not me. Um, I reckon my first game was 89. So I've got 10 years on Foggy, which I think was a Fulham game. And I think we won it. Should really have fact checked that, shouldn't I? Um, and I haven't. I went with a mate and a mate's dad, and we went to Bloomfield Road, and I loved it. Just to pick up on Nathan's point about not being a boring club, I mean, as we're going to cover, that is, to say the least, not true about Blackpool. In 48th place on the all time Premier League table, it's the highest placed team of our one season wonders in Blackpool. Football didn't begin in 1992, though, and the Seasiders' top flight history is a little more storied than just 2010 11. They sit comfortably in mid table of the 65 team all time top flight in 31st, just behind Coventry City and ahead of Ipswich Town. Blackpool spent five seasons in the top flight in the period between the First and Second World War, then 21 seasons that followed it before relegation in 1967. They played in three FA Cup finals during that same period, famously lifting the old trophy in 1953 in what became known as the Matthews Final, despite another stand, his teammate Mortensen, scoring a hat-trick. There was a brief return for a season in 1971, the same year they won the Anglo-Italian Cup, but relegation would follow and they'd be in the fourth 
fourth tier within a decade. Between 79 and 2007, Blackpool were never higher than the third tier before two promotions in four seasons would seal a return to the top flight for the first time since the 1970s. I mean, that's a whistle-stop tour. Uh, mm. Nathan, we'll come to the Premier League season shortly, but for you as a Blackpool fan, how important is that era of Matthews, Mortensen, later Jimmy Armfield, to like the history of Blackpool and, and to the present-day fan? Can we just talk about how good you have to have played to have a final named after you and somebody else got a hat trick? <laughs> <laughs> Could you just imagine how good that performance must have been? You scored three goals. When I was a kid, it was nice to have some kind of like, history to hold on to. Like I remember being in school, like just find, finding this random like book in my library, which was kind of like football's greatest games or whatever, and reading about the Matthews final and kind of seeing like, oh wow, like that's my team who were like in this book. That's like, oh wow, what, what, that's cool to like read Blackpool in a page of a book. So it was kind of nice to have, and then like I went home and like, oh, dad, did you know about this final? And he's like, oh, yeah, I did. Um, <laughs> I can't, I can't pretend it was like a big thing day to day. And it was nice whenever I got to talk to like an older fan who remembered those days, just being like, what was football like in 1950? Mm. It's just like it's like an alien planet to me. Stanley Matthews, he was the first ever player to win the Ballon d'Or. The runner-up that year was Di Stefano. He played for you till he was 46 years old as well, which, again, is an- another incredible thing. Uh, and, and let's, all- let's be honest, though. The wages weren't as good. Yeah, so, you, to- you know, you've got to put a shift in. <laughs> just kept going. Uh, Mortensen scored 21 goals in 23 caps for England. Armfield captain England. He was part of the 66 squad. I mean, again, for you, what did those names mean to you? And Jimmy Armfield as well, who was a, obviously still a regular all those years as well at, Black- uh, at Bluefield road for so long really important um stan matthews is obviously a footballing legend he always will be now there's a question is he a blackpool footballing legend or is he a stoke city footballing legend now i i I went to kill university so i lived in stoke for four years there's a statue of sir stan in hanley town center i'm gonna let them have it he came to us he was fantastic for us Absolutely fantastic for us. You know, how many statues do you want to put up of one person? I'm going to let Stoke have it. We've got statues of Morty. We've got a statue of Sir Jemmy. But they are all legends of the club. So moving on to 2009-2010 then, Blackpool are preparing for their third season back in the Championship after 16th and 19th place finishes in the two previous years under the guidance of Simon Grayson. Ian Holloway, a man with a solid, if unspectacular, CV of 600-plus games in the dugout is the man brought in as the permanent replacement following the caretaker spell of Tony Parks and Steve Thompson. Nathan, uh, Ian Holloway at this stage, he's sort of a solid lower league manager. He's perhaps as well known for his quips in press conferences as he years for his achievements on the pitch uh, one promotion as QPR manager he joins on a one year deal he feels like he's been brought in as kind of consolidation for the championship can you remember what your thoughts were on his appointment at that time I don't think I was that excited I thought yeah like he'll keep us up but I think I did the same thing that everyone did I immediately went on to Wikipedia and then saw his like stats and then saw all his quotes and I was like oh he's quite a funny guy but then immediately it kind of became very obvious after we started talking that the Ian Holloway that had been the manager for QPR in Plymouth was not the manager that we were getting him back. He basically had this come to Jesus moment and then basically changed his entire philosophy that summer where he'd had a year out from work after being fired from Leicester. Leicester got relegated on the final day of the season and they needed one goal to, to, on the last day to stay up and they didn't score and I think they drew nil nil or lost one nil and they just needed one goal. And like, that is so far away the experience on we got from Holloway where I can't imagine ever Blackpool needing a goal and, and not getting it. So like he had this entire change of uh, management style where it was just attack 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 which when you've been a lower league football team in, in england for in in that era might have changed a bit now it was it was unheard of so immediately once he started talking it was a, a much more exciting and i think he just kind of got the town got the weirdness of it the quirkiness of it he said you know blackpool's like me we both look better in the dark that's like it, it's kind of like got the quirkiness and the campness and the, the funness of the town and started bigging us up where i started to think like yeah, we, we, we're a good team. And after four or five games, you start to realise it's something special. He's a big character. He's a colourful character. He's he's generally well liked by all of the all the clubs and actually adored by lots of them. Brought an attacking swashbuckling style. I mean, his reign begins with a seven game unbeaten run. Blackpool spend pretty much the entire season just inside or on the very edges of the playoffs, which is where they find themselves on the second of May, when a point against Bristol City is enough to book them a place against Nottingham Forest in the playoffs, who they beat six four on aggregate. After falling behind twice, Blackpool secure their top flight return with a three two 
three win over Cardiff City at Wembley. Chris, that entire season just seems to get better and better. What are your memories of watching Blackpool booking a place in the Premier League? And could you have ever imagined seeing Blackpool in the top flight? No. So <laughs> when we went up to the Championship, uh, Valeri Bellicom, who was an investor who came into the club, was on TV at the end of the game. You know, we just won the playoffs into the Championship. And he went, I'm going to get us into the Premier League in five years. And my mate and I looked at each other and laughed out loud. They did it in four years. Genuinely, I cannot watch... I've watched that playoff final so many times. And I cannot watch that Charlie Adam free kick without crying. I can't watch it. And there is there is incredible footage, isn't there, on YouTube of this from the stands? Like there's kind yeah. of a you, like obviously there's the TV footage, which is brilliant, but there is one from quite high up in the Wembley stands that gives the scale of it and the the bedlam that followed. So so all yeah. the all these years on, it still reduces you to a blubbering wreck. I, I can't I can't cope with it. I, I genuinely can't. It's like watching the end of ET. It really really all watership <laughs> down. There's three things that make me cry on a regular basis. E.T., Watership Down, and Charlie Adams' free kick at Wembley. <laughs> Can't cope with it, mate. There were rumours that Holloway was actually ready to resign on the eve of the new season with no players signed, something he would deny. But then came a quintet of incoming transfers on the 11th of August as Premier League football was about to begin and a further eight before the transfer window slammed shut. Most of the fees were undisclosed but Craig Cathcart joined from Manchester United, Marlon Harewood joined on a free transfer from Aston Villa, Chris Basham from Bolton and former Loney and playoff hero DJ Campbell from Leicester all brought in Premier League experience. Luke Varney was also signed on a season-long loan from Derby County. Nathan, did that transfer window fill you with hope? Bear in mind, many of those players had had pre-seasons elsewhere, if at all. Yeah. It, was a, it, was, it was a lot of late business, wasn't it? Which I know you touch upon in the book as yeah, to, as to why was. that was. Yeah, well, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't have signed a single player three days before the first game, including a, a, an Israeli centre-back called Dekel Keenan, who we'd announced a month and a half earlier, I think, but still hadn't joined until about a week because of work that yeah, it was uh, Ian Holloway. It was either the worst week of his life or the, the best week of his life. And I just thought, Ian, you, with thirty-eight games this season, you need to like, you need to bring a bit of an even keel to this. That was like the Sky Sports era of deadline day before everyone realised what a load of shite it was. Where it was, and when I was, and I was seventeen at the time, so like I had a lot of spare time because I was at college where you don't really have to do anything much. <laughs> so like, I was just, oh my god, we're going to sign everyone in the world. And then we signed nobody. And we were losing out. We, I think we got linked. To, we tried to sign John Stead and Brett Pittman, if I, if I remember right. But I think we both went to Bristol City, who were championship sides. So we were like losing out on championship strikers to championship teams. We didn't have any money up front because you get it three months. You get 12 million, I think, three months into the year. But they just didn't sign anyone. And like they, they had no preparation. They had no, they had no idea they were going to get promoted. We didn't have anyone to really scout players other than he and Ian Holloway and his friend. They always wasn't a very good scout of talent. It's amazing that the players who brought in were as good as they were, actually, in that first transfer window. We didn't even get DJ Campbell, who would just sign, like, if it was one transfer, you just get signed, done, deal, delivered on the first day of a window. It's like the guy who you just had on loan who you get promoted with. Like, that's just an obvious thing. It's like, yeah, what are you going to pay? We didn't get until deadline day. Like, we played five games like DJ Campbell, who scored, I think, 11 in 19 for us. It's just fat. it just boggles the mind, and and yet we never <laughs> beat Wigan four one in the first game of the season. Despite Holloway claiming to be unsure of having a side that would survive in the Championship, let alone the Premier League, Blackpool get off to a dream start with a four 0 win at Wigan that briefly leaves them top of the league ladder for the first time since the opening day of the fifty seven fifty eight season. A six 0 defeat at the Emirates a week later suggests Holloway might have a point about squad depth, but a debut goal for Luke Varney in a two two draw at home to Fulham, and a sort of debut goal for DJ Campbell at St James's Park following his permanent move to seal a 2-0 win, leaves Blackpool with seven points from their opening four games to mark an impressive start to life back in the top flight. Chris, that point at home to Fulham was the first top flight action at Bloomfield Road in almost 40 years after the Premier League agreed to schedule their first two fixtures away to allow for the East Stand to be finished. What was what was that afternoon like for as a Blackpool fan to see them in the top flight at Bloomfield Road? Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Do you know what? That's the one thing I miss about the Prem, is being able to watch games. <laughs> I live in London. I don't get to Bloomfield Road as often as I want. And it's amazing. But we were talking about um, the squad. Bunch of journeymen. Bunch of, bunch of grafters. Bunch of lads who either been through their career or have been overlooked by other teams. That was 
what Holloway did. He put them together and he created a team. Yes, there was a talisman that was Charlie Adam, um, but it was about building something bigger. Mm. You know, have you seen the film Moneyball with Brad Pitt, where it's all about baseball and it's all about building a team? It's not about star players. That's not what it's about. It's not about headline acts. It's all about coercion and, 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 and cohesiveness. That's what they did. And, and watching that at Bloomfield Road, lovely, fantastic. But I'll never forget that first game. That, fir- that first game, my mate texted me and just went, I'm not going to hear the end of this, am I? <laughs> no, no, you're not. Because for about two hours, we were top of the Premier League. Yeah, having watched your side play in, in the fourth tier... To, to, to then be top of the Premier League. There aren't many sides that that can be said for. We we were probably a worse team on paper in the Premier League than we were in the Championship because we didn't have Seamus Coleman, who we got on loan from Everton, who was quality, obviously. Didn't get him back for good, for obvious reasons. We didn't have Stephen Dobby, who was great for us in the number 10 role. Uh, we couldn't get him off Swansea because Carlos didn't want to pay you know a million, million half for him. We didn't have... I mean, we didn't have DJ Campbell for the first five games, but even just missing Coleman and Dobby, I was two players out of our starting 11. I don't know if that's ever happened for where a championship side has got promoted and we're actually weaker uh, going into the season, and probably for most of the season, than we were um, <laughs> in we the championship. It's just unbelievable. But, but those, those early wins, Nathan, I mean, did that fill you with early optimism or did you look at that and kind of think, you know, I, I mean, obviously the players were coming in, they were kind of gelling together as they went. I suppose you might make some comparisons a little bit to what's happened with Forrest this season in terms of, you know, bringing a lot of new players in and, and, and having them gel. I mean, did you feel confident that you could compete at, at the Premier League level quite quickly after, with, with those seven points on board? Yeah, I did, yeah. I mean, we played Man City early on and we lost, but we had two really terrible refereeing decisions go against us and also David Silva scored one of the best Premier League goals of all time. But we like, really played well against Man City and I was like, fucking hell, like, we're really good. Like, this, I don't understand it. Like, why Why has Gary Taylor Fletcher got the best first touch in football? <laughs> I don't understand. Like, he really did as well. G- a- a GTF. He's, he was dynamic. He was yeah, amazing. He looked, he looked like a pub footballer. A big fat lad, but he's dynamic. <laughs> but you could, he could put the ball in there and it just like turn and like hit it on a sixpence and he'd be off. And it was like, it's like, he looks better in the Premier League. I don't know if it's like the space he has rather than in the Championship, but I was like, well, I, just, I just didn't understand it. But you can't deny what you're seeing in front of your eyes. Like you appreciate that. There's some early momentum, but by the time you're a few games in, yeah, even beating Newcastle, like Newcastle went up with us, but they like, obviously dominated the the championship for that one season for in they, they won it by how, however many points. They beat the bat at us 4-0 when we were having a really good stretch to end the season. And then we beat him like pretty convincingly, just like kind of boringly convincingly as well. It wasn't even an end-to-end game. It was just kind of like a competent professional win. So yeah, I was just thinking this team is just so good. And the signings we got, it was a lot of young players who looked like they were going to be good for the future. Kafka, I think, was 22. We got Elliot Grandin, who was 21. Ludo Silvestri, who was about 24. So we weren't signing these 27-year-old players, which actually hurt us in the end. But at least you thought, well, we're doing it the right way. We're buying young players who will sell on. And, and Kafka went and had a good Premier League career. Ludo was a good player for us later down the line. He didn't really have much of an impact on Premier League. But he actually made some decent signings in the first chance window. Blackpool do compete, and the opening half of the season has more than a few highlights. There are wins at home to Wolves and West Brom, victories on the road at Stoke, and a famous 2-1 win at Anfield. Despite two postponements to home games in December against Spurs and Manchester United, Blackpool see out 2010 with a 2-0 win at the Stadium of Light, with a DJ Campbell brace lifting them out of a congested bottom half of the table into eighth place. Chris, you're... Eight points clear of the bottom three with games in hand going into 2011. You're actually closer to a push at the European places than a relegation battle at this stage. Did you ever dare to dream or did it always feel like the road to 40 points? We were going to stay up. I genuinely believe that. Mm. Going into Christmas, I genuinely, genuinely, honestly thought clean sailing. Absolutely. We, we've we got the team. They are working together. They're, yeah, fine. We'll lose against Man United. But we've got enough to... Uh, secure staying in the Premiership. Absolutely, 100%, nailed on, no question at all. Yeah, I was at the City game, uh, the Man City game we played New Year's Day, and I was in a mar- really good pub in Manchester called the Marble Arch, I was there with my dad, and we were talking about it, and I remember saying the words, we probably won't get Europe, but at least we won't get a relegate. And I was so confident. It, was like, it wasn't even a thing for me. Wasn't even, and Because I, I thought we'd get better. Because I thought, well, now we're eight. We'll be able to attract better players. We had every reason to be confident. Every reason to be confident. We were doing it. 
Yeah. We were there. You, you have a few good games. You're riding a wave of momentum. You know, it's 18, 17 games into the season. So. You beat Liverpool at Anfield. Do you think I'm going to stay up? Did I think we would ever win the Premiership? No. Absolutely not. Did I think we were going to go to Europe? No. Absolutely not. Did I think we'd get 14th, 15th, 16th? Yeah. And and great. Happy with that. And I think many neutral fans would would have agreed would agreed with that. Obviously, that that start of the season was 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 so fantastic. I mean, Nathan, I went back and read the BBC match report of that win at Anfield. It describes them as a joyful Blackpool side that blended a work rate and commitment with slick passing. And there was a joie de vivre about Blackpool. What do you recall about that day at Anfield? Was it the afternoon you really arrived as a Premier League side as well? I mean, I think Chris has just touched upon it there of going, you beat Liverpool, you you're a Premier League team, and you're going to stay there. I think it was like the peak of other fans really kind of like showing my love to us. Like my brother was studying in Liverpool at the time at uni, and so me and I think our whole family went. I don't know if you went on the game, it might have just been my dad, but like I remember just the fan, the camaraderie in the away fans as well. I remember like picking up some little kid and like throwing him in the air kind of thing. It was so like joyous, and it just felt like it's us against the world kind of thing. But it wasn't really. I mean, that was the day that Liverpool were protesting against Hicks and Gillette, the old owners. So they were staying in after the game as a kind of like a lock-in protest. And they clapped off the Blackpool uh, players off the pitch and clapped the Blackpool fans out of the stadium, which after with all the turmoil they were going through, was, uh, I think Blackpool fans always remember that as a really classy move. And I mean, I know Liverpool weren't great that season, but I'm pretty sure they brought Fernando Torres off the bench that game and he was like, he just, he just couldn't do anything. Liverpool in Anfield and it's Blackpool. And we like, we're fully deserved of the three points we got. And then we beat him again at home. Yeah, we did the double. And we did one and a half over Spurs. These results against against the so-called bigger bigger sides in the league, picking up the points, the bonus points, if you like, as well, which is normally the sign of a side that's going to going to stay up. Moving into the new year, obviously, it's not quite as fruitful as the months that precede it. Um, despite completing the double over Liverpool in early January, their first since 1946-47, by the way, it's the only win in their first nine games of 2011 that drags them firmly into the relegation battle. Among these games are late defeats to West Brom and Birmingham. That one looks costly by the season's end by the way a 2-0 lead over Manchester United and a 3-2 lead at Goodison Park both see the Seasiders leave empty-handed Chris it's always the case in any season with ifs and buts if any of those results I've just mentioned end differently it would almost certainly have been the difference between staying up and going down are there any of those games that particularly sting looking back where you had the lead and you let it go there's one reason and one reason alone that we went down that season Matt Jilks getting injured that's the sole reason we went down. That's the sole reason. They all sting because they could all have been better. There's, the, the, Matt Jones getting injured was what sent us down. And it's not the lad's fault. There's no footballer in the world who wants to break his leg. But, you know, <laughs> you know that's, that's what did it. If we'd had him, we'd have stayed up. I genuinely believe that. Breaks my heart. We were actually missing our second choice goalkeeper as well because we had Rahubku, who was actually pretty decent for us. I don't know if he would have made a step up to a Premier League, but he was a pretty good keeper for us for a while. Trips was a great goalkeeper. Is he still with us in the Prem? Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. But he was but injured the whole fucking year. hell were we playing Richard Kingston every week? <laughs> because he was injured. The two of them were injured. Oh, was Trips injured? I'd forgotten that. I'll tell you the what, Richard Kingston, I, I don't know whether you can put this out. <laughs> Genuinely, I've never seen a footballer who every time he entered the football pitch, I wondered whether he'd been drinking. Like, like <laughs> properly drink, Like, not even just like a couple of drams. I'm talking like he was arsehole every single game. What a liability. That man sent us down. There you go. It wasn't, do you know what? It wasn't Jules breaking his leg. It was Richard Kingston. Richard Kingston solely sent Blackpool down that season. There we go. I'm done now. Thank you. We, we, we Shall I turn this off? <laughs> There's the exclusive that comes out, just, just as the king. Nathan, advice. disagree. Go on, I dare you. It was probably the best third-choice goalkeeper about the bottom half of a team. He was a third-choice goalkeeper. He weren't supposed to play 10 games. It was, it was madness that he was even playing. We had the entire January transfer window, basically, to replace him, and we did Well, there was a point where we were linked with Shea Given, and we were going to get Shea Given for half a million quid. Christ! <laughs> Almighty. Let's let's give Richard Kingston a couple of bottles of Buckfast and see what he does. <laughs> Fucking hell! I mean, honestly, I mean, I'm not, I'm no footballer, you know. I can't do it, but I can do it better than he can. He wasn't the worst goalkeeper at Blackpool. 
Who was the worst goalkeeper in Blackpool? <laughs> well, the, the Kingston family have just switched off. Uh, the, <laughs> Good riddance. The, the long-awaited second league win of the calendar year finally arrives with a 3-1 win over a Spurs side fresh from beating Milan in the Champions League that lifts Blackpool back up to 12th, but it's also the beginning of a nine-game run without a victory that will really spell trouble now for Ian Holloway's men. Nathan, there are January deadline day signings of Andy Reid, James Beattie, Jason Pussy... <laughs> 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 and Sergey Sergey Kornilenko, who will contribute. Hey. To... <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> don't don't remember seeing him play. <laughs> they they will let's let's to put it, to put it discreetly, they will contribute to various degrees in the months ahead. Uh, but on paper, those players. <laughs> You're talking about getting pissed with fucking <laughs> Richard <laughs> Kingston. <laughs> <laughs> Sergey Konolenko, if anyone doesn't know, is a deadline day sign. He's a six foot four Belarusian who smoked. He, was, he smoked during the Premier League season and he apparently liked to go out and enjoy himself. I mean, it feels like a panicky strategy, those players. Andy Reid, James Beatty, these are players who, even in sort of 2011, are coming towards the end of their kind of Premier League careers. I mean, is again, is that what it felt like? And, and, and let's just reflect on that Shea Given, the potential to sign Shea Given, which again could have been a, a season changing transfer. Yeah, that would have finished. That would have changed everything. We didn't have any idea what we were doing in, in the transfer window at all. Sergey Konolenko was that someone sent Ian Holloway, the, like his agent called him on deadline day. He said, my, my, I've got a player. He's at London Airport. He's at Heathrow. He's obviously arrived just thinking, if I'm in England with an hour to go to the deadline, someone's going to sign me because I'm here and I can start, I can get them somewhere. Just it's full on chance. It's like, let's get to England and someone will panic and it was Blackpool. And they played in five games. It's just unbelievable. I mean, BT and Reed were forgivable because you thought they could maybe add some. And Reed, to be fair, he had a couple of games where he looked decent. And he, he was the kind of player, if he was just in more in shape. And I, he did pretty well for Forrest after us, I think. So I think like a year earlier, even a year later, he would have been the same kind of player. But, but I remember Andy Reed, uh, he might not have been fit. He, well, he definitely wasn't fit enough to play for Premier League. But he, he was so shocked coming to Blackpool because we played this attacking style. Right? We just attacked, attacked, attacked. I talked to Steve Thompson, uh, an assistant coach, and he said that uh, one day in the Premier League, he was being told to meet a new signing. Go and meet him, and it was like at some Hilton, it's like a Hilton hotel with a gym in. So Steve Thompson goes to this hotel, and he just sees this lad in like a Blackpool training top. So he goes, he goes over to him and says, "Well, I am Steve Thompson, you know, assistant manager. You know, we'll get you down to Spoon for a road. You get you settled in the lads." And this guy's just like, "What?" And it's just like a fan in a Blackpool top. <laughs> Imagine being, you know, French or Belarusian or Spanish, all these guys who signed from abroad, and you're, you're a culture shock going to Blackpool. And it's like, you don't speak the language. Nobody else speaks the language. And it's just, here's a and b that you're staying in for a couple of weeks. You're playing on Saturday. Yeah. No one knows what you look like. Yeah. Ian Holloway has told this story publicly, so I'm not breaking any news here. But in, in the pre-season, we went on a training trip to Dover. Pre-season Premier League, not like Spain, not Dubai, Qatar for the warm winter camp. It was Dover. We played on rugby pitch, cricket pitches. Colchester United, League Two team, refused to play on the pitch. Blackpool played. One of the players, who wasn't very good, Billy Clark, a rotation player, got injured, broke his leg and was out for the rest of the season. So you're down one player before you've even signed one. Ian Holloway invited a waiter to play. A waiter from, that had served him a meal the night before to join their Premier League pre-season camp to play. Scouting was not uh, our strong point uh, at all, to be honest. Yeah, that does feel like a throwback to a bygone era. Again, we talked about something that was a little over a decade ago. But they used to say that. that that's how it used to get pitched. Sir Stanley Matthews used to run along the beach, and that's how he trained. Yeah. You can do that. Mm. That's how it was pitched. Yeah. The training ground was good enough 50 years ago. It worked until we got 90 million quid, and we were all like, what? Why is Owen Iveson walk around with bundles of cash walking out, out of his pocket? After a 93rd minute Brett Emerton goal had beaten them at Bloomfield Road earlier in the season, another 93rd minute goal from Junior Hoylett salvages a point for Lancashire rivals Blackburn at Ewood Park as more precious points are lost late on. Then, on the 16th of April, defeat at home to Wigan, the game they'd won so convincingly in the reverse fixture on opening day, is the match that dumps them into the bottom three for the very first time. Uh, Chris, there's usually at least one team that appears to be comfortable in mid -tail. Table, has a terminal run towards the drop zone in the Premier League. They're still fighting Blackpool, as we'll discuss in a moment, but you've been looking over your shoulders for months at this point. You, you said at the start of the show, you know, you, you were so convinced. Is this the moment where you kind of thought, actually, this is now becoming a really realistic possibility? Yeah, February. Mm. February was when I thought, shit, 
genuinely thought we could pull it back and I thought we'd be all right. We had that run after uh, after Christmas. I, I was absolutely devastated about that because, because it was all going so well. Don't win in, need to win every game. Win enough. Draw enough. Lose a few more. <laughs> but yeah, it was that run of January, February that killed us off. Yeah. Really. Uh, Blackpool pick up three consecutive draws off the back of dropping into the bottom three for the first time against Newcastle, a first home clean sheet of the season against Stoke, and then within minutes of a double over Spurs until Jermaine Defoe strikes to rob them of another famous away victory. It's enough to lift them out of the drop zone for 24 hours until Wolves beat West Brom the next day and they're back in there. Nathan, there follows one of the games of the season at Bloomfield Road as Blackpool and Bolton do their best to recreate the Matthews final. Talk me through that game and what it did for your survival hopes. Well, not much, really, because we still had to go and get some at United. So but I think there was hope that we could maybe do something in that game, but other, that stay up, but other results kind of went against us. But it was it was very exciting because we were finally looking like Blackpool again. So we'd fanned about for two months, trying to play James Beattie and Andy Reid and Sergei Konolenko. And we had jokes back by then. We had Keith Southern back, who was, a really, who was like really made our midfield click. It was like this perfect midfield with Charlie Vitalis, like David Vaughan was kind of like the shifty little doing smaller passes, very like Spanish kind of style of play, and Keith Southern just doing all the tackling. And it was just like a perfect trio for the way football was played back then. And we had him back, so we finally looked like our team again. I was thinking, like, if, if we just weren't playing Man United, we would have beaten any other team on that last game. And if the season was one game longer or if we'd just got back into form one game sooner, but it was finally like we are clicked. And I was telling that Man, Man United, mate, like we are going to beat you because I was still pretty good. I thought Man United would let us win because they owed us a favour. We let them uh, not Nobby Taylor after the Munich Air disaster. Come on, you owe us a favour. <laughs> let us win. <laughs> just call in the debt. <laughs> It's quite a dusty IOU um, you now. Well, despite the victory, the revival of Wolves means the Seasiders do head to Old Trafford on what Sky Sports bill as Survival Sunday, with just one point separating 15th place Blackburn and 19th place Wigan. Despite falling behind, Blackburn go level through Charlie Adam before taking the lead through Gary Taylor Fletcher. Goals from Anderson, Michael Owen, and an Ian Ever own goal would confirm their fate, though, as they join Birmingham and West Ham in relegation to the Championship. Chris, it's heartbreak at the end as United prepare to lift a record 19th title at the time. They give Blackpool a warm reception it's fair to say the attacking style that Blackpool have brought it wins a lot of friends just not quite enough points is there is there any consolation at all in becoming everybody's favorite second favorite team uh, for, for a year there is actually um not consolation in getting relegated although I didn't mind going back down to the championship I think I prefer the championship to the premiership although I want us to go back up to the prem I think a mid-table championship side is probably where Blackpool are at the moment I would like us to go further, and I think with the right investment and with some shrewd moves, we can do. And I think we could bounce around the Premiership and the Championship. Um, a Stoke, you know, somebody like that. I think that's that's where Blackpool are. We're, we're not the top boys. We're not the top guns, and we don't need to be. Your question was, was, it, was there any consolation in being everybody's second team? Yeah, there was. Because no matter where you went, for the first time ever, you could say, yeah, I'm a Blackpool fan. And they go, oh, yeah, Ian Holloway, oh, Charlie Adam, oh, DJ Campbell, oh, blah, blah, blah. And people knew. People just knew. They knew the name of our stadium. Fine. It's all forgotten now because we're 10 years out. Um, but people still remember Blackpool in the Prem. And they still remember Holloway. They still remember all of that stuff. So, you know, that's that's important. Well, let's let's come to that, Nathan. The, the man, the mastermind behind it all, Ian Holloway, very nearly took you up straight back up the following season as well. He does leave for Palace and get them promoted, but leaves eight games, citing the pressure of the job um, at that level when he's back in the Premier League with Palace. I mean, a cult hero, how much fun is it to have him manage your side? How is he remembered and thought of at Blackpool now? Well, he's a hero to me. I mean, he gave us the best time that I'll probably ever have spotting Blackpool in my life. And I was very aware of it at the time. I was like, I'm going to enjoy this moment while it lasts because it's not going to I might live another 60 years and I'll never see anything like this. So... That's will always enjoyable for me. But I think the Blackpool fans, Ian Holloway is can be a bit of a pain in the arse sometimes. And he says some things, and he's backed Oyston a, a lot in this protest year. So there are a lot of fans who don't want anything to do with him. I think most will definitely say, like, okay, yeah, if there's nuance there, and they'll say, well, obviously, he was great for us. A couple of, one or two, maybe more, 
weird and bitter in my mind. But like in terms of like him returning back to Bloom for a road or anything like that, I don't think he's really done anything else as a manager since or that much before. I think it was just lightning in a bottle and we can enjoy it for what it was, which was this perfect time for a lot of players and managers and a lot of players didn't do much before or after Bapu either that we had. So he's going to have an interesting legacy, I think. The only regret I've got about Ian Holloway, which really soured everything, was that he left the club on a Saturday morning before a game. Mm. And that afternoon at three o'clock, Palace had about on the pitch saying, this is our new manager. And I'll never forgive that. I, I love the man. Because he left Plymouth to go to Leicester and he said, I'll never walk out on a team again. And he said it a lot. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm different to Foggy. I'd have him back in a heartbeat. Let's, let's have another roll of the dice. Can you do it again? I'd, listen, I'd be in it. It'd take me 30 seconds to be back in. Like, you know, emotion is making a big part of that. Yeah, of course it is. But that's football. It's all about emotion. We've not actually even discussed uh, Holloway's threat to quit when he's fined for making 10 changes to his side. I mean, what are your memories of, of, of that incident? I can understand his point. Like, what's the point in doing my job? You allow me a squad. Well, if you allow me a squad, then I'm allowed to use what players I want in that squad. He was, he was absolutely right. He was an empty threat. Of course he wasn't going to quit. The fine was disgusting. And I think the whole the whole thing was absolutely ridiculous because there isn't a manager in the game that doesn't do it. Once you, you say you have a 25-man squad and you can't have 26, you've kind of made a rough for own back, but you've told the plant manager that like, you have this 25-man squad, that like, you are now taking the Premier League, so he should be able to free to do whatever the hell he wants. Like, the Premier League were right. The, the sort of accusation was correct. Like, he rested the squad because he wanted to not care about the Villa game and play Wolves, who was our relegation rivals. But big question about whether we should have done it, because we could have won that game. And then we only drew to Wolves in the end. So we got one point from it. So it would have been interesting if we would have actually just played the reals. The thing is, we, our conditioning was just crap. Blackpool are not, they don't have a fitness coach. They don't have sports science. You know, the, the players are eating McDonald's and Domino's and Chinese takeaway after a game. They're having microwavable meals on the coach. On, like Chelsea, when they played Chelsea, the Chelsea team offered them 15 quid ahead, we've got our restaurant, all the players eat here, and we're doing, you know, lasagna and veg and all that. And Carl Oster said, no, we're not paying 15 quid ahead. Club secretary, go to St. Andrews, get a load of microwaveable meals, we've got a microwave coach. And that's what Blackpool are eating after playing Chelsea away in the Premier League. The centre of excellence. Don't forget the centre of excellence. The centre of excellence, yeah. Excellence spelt wrong over the centre of excellence. Blackpool centre of excellence. Yeah, I mean, Kevin Phillips joined a couple of years later, 38 years old, like, obviously consummate professional, fitter than any player in the team. He would commute from Birmingham, so he would eat at home, and then he would come to Blackpool for the training, and he would need something else before the training session. He would have to go to McDonald's just to get a plain porridge, because there was nothing for him at the stadium, there was nothing for him at the training. But wasn't he picking up McDonald's orders for the other lads as well? Probably, yeah. He was... Genuinely, I remember him saying that. He was, was it, like, they'd put their McDonald's order in before a training <laughs> he's session. Ordering, he's ordering plain porridge and apples, probably, and the rest of them are probably ordering, like, egg McMuffins and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> The centre of excellence, excellence, their plunge pool, their ice bath, was a bin. It was a wheelie bin. <laughs> it used to fill a bin with water and ice, and that was the recuperation. Let's take a moment to reflect on the last 30 years on the whole for Blackpool. Alongside their solitary season in the top flight, they spent 19 of the 30 seasons since 92-93 in the third tier. Two seasons in the fourth, both ending in seventh place and promotion via the playoffs. And there have been eight seasons in the championship, which, as we record, this is where they find themselves currently with a bit of a battle to remain there. So that's four relegations and five promotions in 30 years, suggesting it's rarely boring on the field either. Uh, much like their previous relegation from the top flight, Blackpool found themselves back in the basement division in under a decade and have been building back from there ever since. But there is, of course, a big story behind the statistics. Now, we still have to be moderately careful about how we describe the tenure of your former owners. But Chris, let's start with you. Can you describe sort of as factually as possible what happened in those years following relegation from the Premier League? And what is it like to be the subject of a lawsuit from the owners of the football club that you love? I hate them. I absolutely hate them. I hate everything about them. Is that a soundbite? That's <laughs> <laughs> now, now.
now with the door closed behind them, they're gone. But obviously, you know, that was such a such a period, which for, for the neutral fan, for the non-Blackpool fan, you know, we, we all witnessed it and, and knew that something terrible was going on. Football, even your rivals, United behind Blackpool as well which is a remarkable thing it's very rare that you see that happen I mean that just kind of shows just just how bad things were doesn't it here's how it is they ripped the arse out of my football club they ripped the arse out of the town because uh, there was just no love there anymore Um, and when they ripped the arse out of all of that they came for my fucking friends and they started suing them I hate them I hate everything about them I read Nathan's book. Now, Nathan is a journalist. He is calm and he is considered and he is measured. And also, he cares about not getting sued. Um, I think I put on social media that I'd read your book and how good I thought it was and how I really thought it absolutely encapsulated it and that I could not write that book. I couldn't write it because I couldn't I couldn't be that calm because I, you went through what I went through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, I was a moderate, moderator on the farm as well. So, like, yeah, Paul was my mate, like, um, well, you know, football internet mate. You know, I'm not going to pretend I sort of would best mates him in sort of real life, but it was in my head. Yeah, but you and, you, you and I and Paul have hung out yeah, before. Like, you know, I, really, no, I, spend, I spend a lot of time, many, many, many hours talking to Paul, trying to help him with his legal case. Like, I really became invested in it. So, yeah, it, it, we were, like, close at that time. And just seeing somebody go through it. I mean, Paul's talked about it, and, and, and he was kind enough to be very honest with the book. You know, he had... Carl Easton and what Owen Eisen did to him by suing him for something that he didn't write, for something which wasn't libelous, it was very much true. One of the posts I've tried to sue for was just listing financial transactions in the club accounts in ink. We should probably, we should, for the listener, we should probably explain. Um, so Nathan and I were moderators on a um, message board, football message board. There's hundreds of thousands of them around the world. This one was called Back Henry Street, and it was a Blackpool football board. Nathan and I were moderators. Paul, Paul Crashley, was the owner of the board. He ran it. Uh, it wasn't the most popular board for Blackpool fans, um, it's fair to say, but it was it was popular enough. And some people wrote some stuff about the Oystens, and the Oystens threatened to sue. And for whatever reason, those posts didn't get taken down. Just I, And I think it was honestly a mixture of apathy and... An honest forgetfulness. Not there was no willing sort of maliciousness behind it, and they threatened to sue Paul for fifty thousand pounds, which would have, I think it's fair to say, pretty much crippled him. It would have, it would have really it would have really you know financially crippled him. And for, you know, for fifty grand isn't it's fifty grand, isn't it? It's not gonna, you know it doesn't tickle with anybody, um, and that's what they that's what they threatened to do. And to go living with that, because court cases last a long time and they get dragged out. So living with that over your head, that black cloud over your head, whereas you could get bankrupt. He just, you know, I don't want to you know, spit his personal life out, but he was going through personal stuff and he just met his new girlfriend and he was trying to like, how do I tell this new girlfriend that I may be starting a new life with, but I'm currently being sued. And I think it was for more, eventually for more than 50 grand. How do I tell, it just hung over him and he said it, it was all he could think about. He said it was just this thing that was there, like a tumour that was just there all the time. That and he had depression, he couldn't sleep, and he said that you know he had to take therapy for it, and, and like he, uh, until he couldn't afford a therapy anymore, and that's two or three years of his life that he'll never get back. For fuck all, and they never got any money out of him because it was it was dropped because it was a stupid case. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I studied libel law at uni, and you can say should a football club ever sue its fans as a as a sort of ethical point, and the answer most people come to is no. But from a legal point, you could say well there are some things that fans say which is libelous. There was absolutely nothing on that website that would ever, 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 ever pass in front of a judge and say, yeah, you owe this this family money. And Paul Grashy, very decent guy. There were some Blackpool fans who took it too far, probably, but not that they gave a shit. Paul Grashy, very decent. He wasn't even a big Blackpool fan. He just wanted to like let people hang out on his message board. He, went, he was going mostly for his daughter to go on the games. He wasn't even a big Blackpool fan at the time. And they went after him, and they went after people with ruthless, ruthlessness, like the sort of stuff you would only see in a, in a TV show, like absolutely, ru- they wanted to destroy people's lives um, and they, they very nearly did. And, and Nathan, I mean, Chris Chris has already touched upon it. Your, your book is a, it's a fantastic read. It's, it's very measured. How was that process bringing all that together, that collective trauma that you as fans had gone through, which you've put into your book and is, is hugely well received by, by the fan base? 
I mean, it was a few years removed, so you've got some calmer heads. I was also involved with it at the time, so I also had kind of my contemporaneous notes and sort of knowledge of the situation. I think the people who were sued, there was about 11 of them, that became a kind of little fraternity of brotherhood there where they all supported each other and came together and helped each other. And at least you had other people going through it who knew what you were going through. But these are like people with no knowledge of the law, because why would they? And all of a sudden you have to become an expert on law because you can't afford a, a solicitor. And like you're researching, so you might have a brainwave. And Paul was saying that sometimes that his, he had insomnia and he said sometimes it weren't for worry. It was like he would just have this idea and he would set off a chain of chain and then he would be up all night because he's thinking about this one little thing might help me lose 40 grand instead of 50 grand because a lot of times it's just about reduction of damages so like they they deserved their story so and that was very important to me too to give and 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 like getting all that in the book was really important because they all have their passages in the book um and, and a good chunk is dedicated uh in, just in terms of pages in terms of words on page to, to them um so they all they all had a chance to, and, and and it just it speaks for itself really um there were some fans who were sued and they were sued so it started off normally with a uh, they would settle for 20 grand is that right foggy if i got that if i remembered that right the first one was for 20 i think one was for 10 but there was there was one man in particular who was sued and he was a pensioner uh because of something that he'd written that was a bit nasty about the oysters on a message um so they sued him and there was a crowdfunding campaign to pay i i think it was 20 grand yeah, and there is a very strong rumour that a certain Hollywood actor, an a, an absolute A-lister, put in 10 grand of that himself, having heard about it. That's the thing. That's where Blackpool got to. 20 years ago, nobody would have cared. One season in the Prem, and suddenly Blackpool is brought to the forefront. As far as the Oyston family were concerned, once Blackpool was brought to the front, forefront, there was nowhere to hide. Everything was of interest. What they were doing, what they were up to, where's the money gone? That wouldn't have been of any interest if we'd been in, you know, League Two. That maybe in itself is the Prem's legacy, that we got rid of them. And it took, fine, it took eight years, but we got rid of them. Blackpool narrowly missed out on an immediate return to the top flight the season after their relegation with Ricardo Vazte's late goal promoting West Ham at the seaside's expense. From there, the gradual dismantling of the squad, a raft of managers following Ian Holloway's departure and the sort of off-the-field drama a new series of footballers wives might consider far-fetched. Blackpool suffered consecutive relegations in 2015 and 2016 to find themselves back in the basement division. Chris, Gary Bowyer comes in and guides you to promotion and then consolidation back in League One before resigning a game into the season that follows that it seems like quite the achievement on the face of things given everything that was still going off uh, behind the scenes how's Gary Bowyer remembered at Blackpool I didn't mind Gary Bowyer he, was, he did a job um he's not going to I don't think go down in history he was all right he was the right man for the job at the time there's nothing there's, I can't dress that up it's not sexy it's not a sexy quote but it's yeah he, he, he did the job we needed him to do well, you know when we got promoted the fans were still boycotting so you get promoted under Gary Bowyer from the two but I, I wanted us to lose again. Well, I was happy we won, but part of me wanted us to lose again because we were still protesting against the Oysters and it was about not having given him any success. So is, I don't think he will be remembered be honest not not his fault and the managerial revolving door kicks in again with simon grayson returning and neil critchley taking you back to the championship and keeping you there before leaving to join stephen gerrard at aston villa for what will be a shorter than anticipated stay you are under new ownership now you're a couple of years into that the dark cloud both collectively and individually for lots of people has been lifted after the depth we've just gone into in terms of just how dark it got at probably anyone would have been an improvement by some margin but chris let's start with you the new ownership how does that feel now to kind of have your football club back i'm happy I, i'm i'm pretty happy with sackler he seems like a good guy he's making all the right noises uh he's a local blackpool lad he supported blackpool he went off to hong kong or dubai or singapore or wherever it was as a hedge fund manager and made his millions so he's obviously a clever lad good luck to him i say um he's come back he's seen his football clubs in trouble He's bought it for a price that he's happy with. Um, he's making some investments. I would like to see a little bit more. But again, I don't want him to go nuts. I just want him to make the right investments. He has the best interests of the club at heart. Given what we've been through, I can't ask for more than that. He's a normal owner. We can talk about normal things. Why didn't we sign this player? Why did we sell that player? Why have we got loan players? That's what every championship club does. That's what every single championship fan base does is normal. Um, we run our team 
for good and bad, like a team that knows how to operate from one day to the next. We won't forget to register six players for the first game of the season. Because the fax machine's broken. Because the fax machine's broken. We won't leave agents waiting in the office for nine hours while he goes and hides out of a fire escape from his office, which they didn't know he could leave me, which is what Carl Oyston did. Uh, can we can we say that doesn't matter. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to be a professional football club that does stuff uh, good and bad, and we can criticise him for that and, and praise him for that. So that's nice, nice to hear. So we lo- we love a stat on this show. So I've I've gone and looked at the last thirty seasons. What do you think would be Blackpool's average league position on the football league ladder since nineteen ninety two? I am going to say. Tenth in League One. Tenth in League One. Okay, Chris. Any? Are you going higher or lower than that? Higher. You're going to go higher. How much higher are you going? I'll go. Ninth in League One. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're actually both very, very close. It's actually fifty-first in the league ladder, which is effectively seventh in League One. So, so yeah, you you're probably fit in right on the edge of the players of League One. And it is, yeah, a late push. Yeah, exactly. And smack bang in the middle of the league ladder, which is obviously fitting for a side who've been from the bottom to the top, back to the bottom, and are hopefully on their way back up again. We've we've covered it really in terms of the legacy of that Premier League season, I think, in terms of it got rid of the Oysters and whether Blackpool get there. You both seem optimistic it could happen again. You might be a team that bounces around. But life in the Championship, this is, this is the eternal question, actually, that the Premier League is not the be-all and end-all, and the Championship's a really fun division to be in. So is that kind of where, where you'd, you'd like to see Blackpool kind of consolidate for, for, for a few seasons? No, I'd like to see um, Blackpool win the Champions League. I'd like to see us win the Premiership and win the Champions League. That's what I'd like to see, but I'm a realist. <laughs> so I would, I would love us to absolutely secure our spot in the Championship and then... Every so often we bounce up to the Prem and then bounce back again. I'd be happy with that. because, it, And this is the thing, right? I've got lots of friends who are United fans, Chelsea fans, Spurs fans like yourself, Arsenal fans. It must be boring to go, yeah, well, we'll be in the top half of the Premiership. There's no jeopardy. There's no, there's no thrill of the chase there because it's all about the rough and the smooth. And so I'd be very happy to bounce up and down the... Championship and the Premiership. I don't really want to go less than the Championship, to be completely honest with you. But if we do, we do. We've been there before and we've come back. Uh, but yeah, I think a mid-Championship side that occasionally has a real push, happy with that. Can't, yeah, I can't really add any more. Yeah. Um, I don't think you can... I don't understand how anyone can sit through the ocean years and not change the way they view a football club in turn of the owners. So, like, I don't think Newcastle fans are any different from... Burnley fans, the Colchester fans, the West Ham fans, where if the Saudi Arabian royal family who beheads journalists to put a load of money in your football club, Newcastle fans are not the only fans who'd be wearing tea towels on the head. Like, that would happen up and down the country, and it would unfortunately probably happen with Blackpool again. I don't understand how Blackpool fans, and obviously, you know, we, this hasn't happened to us, so I don't want to accuse any Blackpool fans of doing this, but like, if that were, if we were to have that option, surely this experience just teaches you that, like, you want a football club that you can actually be proud of. And, and sometimes that just means your owner makes money in Hong Kong doing stocks or whatever, and you don't know him, and he's gone away, and you, you have the board at the club level. I don't know how you could really want to be one of these teams that does the things they do. And, like, I just don't understand how you can go through what Blackpool did and not ir- irrecoverably change your view of what football it means to you. And if that means we are a championship team, that if we spend $2 million on a player, it's like, wow, that's 90% of our budget gone then fine, because I think we can punch above our weight at times. And I think there is something in the sea air that makes the club a bit weird, that we can find little nuggets and diamonds in the rough and we can punch above our weight at times. So before we move into adding a Blackpool Premier League squad into the archives, let's take a look at the all-time top flight Premier League top scorers and appearance makers of that era. Blackpool's top Premier League appearance makers are Ian Everett, who were featured in all 38 games, starting 36 of them. David Vaughan started 35. Charlie Adam also made 35 appearances also uh, starting in 34 of those. No other player made more than 32 appearances and Matt Phillips made 27 appearances with just six of them being starts, the definition of an impact sub. DJ Campbell is the top scorer in the league with 30, making him the sixth joint top scorer in the whole division and tied with Dirk Coit, 
Rafael van der Vaart and Javier Hernandez. He's closely followed by Charlie Adam with 12. Gary Taylor Fletcher is next on the list with six. And a shout out to Brett Ormerod, whose late goal against Spurs and solitary effort for the season meant he became the first ever Blackpool player to score in all four divisions. Uh, Nathan, let's start with just with DJ Campbell for a second. What an underdog story he has. Released by Villa, has a prolific non league career before coming to prominence in an FA Cup run with Hayes and Yedin. He bounces around a few sides, uh, but the loan spells and permanent moves move to Bloomfield Road appear to be where he finds the form of his career. How appreciated is he? And, and as you've already mentioned, he would have made a big difference, obviously, to that further promotion push the, the season after. Yeah, I'm glad you brought him up, actually, because I kind of forgot about his, his story. It is, it is a real rag. And, and if I remember correctly, I don't want to mischaracterise, but I think he kind of had one of those wrong side of the tracks kind of upbringing kind of stories. And like, I absolutely loved him. Like He was everyone's one of their favourite players. Like The fans sang his name very loudly. And he was just an electric striker. Like, he had that, Ronaldo does it, that kind of chop where you change your pace, where you hit it with your back foot. Like, you're not your lead foot. When the first time he did that and he scored, I was like, is, is that allowed? Like, I've never seen that done before on a football pitch in Blackpool. And then he did it again, like, three weeks later. Yeah, he was just, like, really dynamic and, and just cool as well. Yeah, I think he had a gold tooth, which, again, not something I've seen in Blackpool. Uh, <laughs> not real gold. I presume it was real gold. You don't see real gold much. And he was a real goal scorer. I mean, he scored 13 goals in 29 games in the Premier League. The uh, Premier League is littered with championship strikers who go up and score two goals and then go back down and score 25 in the championship. Like, he managed to actually... I think he was the second or third highest English goal scorer in the Premier League. I was like, get him on the plane. Get him on the plane to... Well, I guess it was after the World Cup. So, get him on the plane to France Euros. It was exceptional. There was one point where Charlie got hold of the ball and he hoofed it right up the field. All of the away support started laughing that he just hoofed it up the field. Suddenly, DJ runs up the pit and it landed at his feet it might have been spurs incredible firstly it was the most incredible shot the most incredible selection Uh, uh, just just absolutely absolutely amazing absolutely amazing well let's stick with charlie adam there because obviously he was your talisman chris i mean you know he he scored 12 he assisted eight he, he signs a contract extension but leaves soon after for liverpool carves out a pretty decent premier league career for himself with stoke after that as well before becoming an established scotland international one of the best players you've ever witnessed in a blackpool shirt i'd imagine yeah he was absolutely incredible just a phenomenal player um but i think fortunate that he was playing with the team that he was playing with there was something about that team that just gelled. And it was built around Charlie, so he had a lot to do with it. So I'll not take anything away from him as far as that's concerned. But in some ways, fortunate to have the lads with him that he had. I think he went to Liverpool and he was out of his depth. I think he went to Stoke and he was he was all right. At Blackpool, he was the star. That's Blackpool. The overall Premier League record is a solitary season where they played 38, won 10, drew 9 and lost 19, scoring an incredible 55 goals along the way but conceding 78, giving them a goal difference of minus 23 and a points total of 39, just one short of the so-called magic 40 mark that was enough to save 17th placed Wolves. Nathan, with 55 goals, Blackpool outscore more than half the division, including 7th place Everton. It's the same number as 5th place Spurs. No side have been relegated before or since in the Premier League era having scored even close to that I mean that is some return for a newly promoted side isn't it yeah it was what we did it was what we did well I mean I was really pissed off where I'd always hear match of the day commentators why are they doing? so naive this is so stupid why don't we defend better if you like Ian Holloway came into the team telling them how to attack and giving them a belief and they played the same way if it was 1-0 down you get the next goal if you're 2-0 up you get the next goal and that's how and it simplified the game for players who weren't very I don't know intelligent on the pitch before Holloway got to and that's how they got promoted. So imagine saying, right, lads, we just got promoted by spagging a load of goal in the championship. Now what we're going to do, what we've never done before, we're going to defend. And no one ever says about a team that goes down with 25 team, 25 points and defend. They're very naive because they didn't attack more. Choosing attack over defence is not inherently bad. Choosing defence over attack is not inherently bad. If you're not going to be good enough to stay up, you're probably going to choose one over the other. And one's not inherently better. So I was, it always frustrated me. And every time we did try and defend, we were shit because we weren't good at defending. What we're good at is attacking. And we got 39 points, which I think there's only two seasons where that wouldn't have kept us up. So we did exactly what we had to do. We just It wasn't enough in that particular season. So we were, we were unlucky and we, we played to our strengths. And that's not being naive. That's understanding what your team is about. 
Well, as part of our countdown for the top 50 Premier League teams of all time, we're placing an agreed starting 11 and five subs into the archives to represent their club in the Premier League era. The only rule is that they must have played at least one game in the top flight for that side. Now, much like our Swindon and Barnsley episodes that preceded this, given Blackpool have only had one season in the top flight, it's a fairly easy selection process. But there were a few decisions to be made. So in goal, it's Matt Jilks. At right-back, Neil Eardley. Centre-backs of Ian Everett and Craig Cathcart with Stephen Craney at left-back. Matt Phillips at right midfield. David Vaughan at left. Elliot Grandin and Charlie Adam in midfield. Uh, in the middle of midfield. And then Gary Taylor-Fletcher and DJ Campbell up front. Uh, on the bench, Baptiste, Southern, Punchin, Harewood and Luke Varney. Which, that, that in, a, in a bench pretty much sums up. The, the attacking approach of Holloway's side. I mean, is there any is there any tough decisions there? I think we've already covered that Matt Jilks in goal over Kingston. I would wasn't. put Baptiste over a back. Yeah, I would agree. And do you know what? On reflection, I think we should put Richard Kingston in goal. <laughs> 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 A late, a late switch, <laughs> Baptiste and Kingston coming to the side. <laughs> no, uh, Baptiste, absolutely. Um, Kingston, I, 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 no, come on. And I think no. Punchin would have made it if he would have played more games, because Punchin was definitely better than Grandin, but um, he was our best signing of the Oh, summer. that's strong, do you think? I, I thought Grandin was excellent. Uh, oh, oh, God. oh God. <laughs> I, thought he had, I thought he had it in him. Uh, while we've got you lads, I need you guys to help me find the greatest player from every nation represented in the Premier League. You lads have got an absolute corker this week. It is the turn of Benin. Now, there have been... Finally. Finally, they're having their moment. <laughs> Benin's <And> chance. <laughs> there have been three players in the Premier League era from the West African nation of Benin who are currently 91st in the FIFA ranking, sandwiched between Syria and Luxembourg. They are all forwards and have 40 goals in 276 Premier League appearances between them, but who is the Premier League's best? They are Rudy Gistad, who made 51 appearances for Cardiff, Aston Villa and Middlesbrough across three seasons between 2013 and 2017. His most prolific top flight season came after a £5 million move from Blackburn to Villa Park, where he scored five goals in 32 appearances in 2015-16, which was just one goal behind top scorer Jordan Ayew as the villains were relegated with just 17 points. Or is it Steve Mooney, Huddersfield Town's top goal scorer in the first season back in the top flight in 2017-18, with seven goals. He was less prolific in his second season with just two in 31 as the Terriers went down. He scored 11 goals in 36 games for his national side and was part of the Benin team that reached the Africa Cup of Nations quarterfinals in 2019. Or is it Stefan Sessignon who made 166 appearances across six seasons for Sunderland and West Brom? He was on the score sheet 25 times and was Sunderland's player of the season in 2011-12 despite being outscored by Nicholas Bentner which is not something anyone wants on their CV. He's a distant cousin of Ryan and Stephen Sessignon and is his nation's all-time top appearance maker and goal scorer with 24 goals in 83 caps. But who is the greatest Beninese Premier League player in the Premier League era? Chris, let's start with you. It's Sessignon, without Sessignon. any question, 100% Sessignon, uh, because it's the only name I've heard of. <laughs> 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 That's, that's played us with as straight a bat as is needed to be, I think, on this. What about you, Nathan? Uh, well, I have Rudy. I, I do know Rudy Gasset. I don't know which Sessignon this is. There was three or four in the Premier League. So I'm going to say Sessignon because I've got a good chance at least one of them is better than Rudy Gasset. Unanimous decision. We will put this I've out. I've not been to Benin in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm holidaying there this year. <laughs> The, the flights are non-stop out of Blackpool Airport. Um, yeah. so, <laughs> <laughs> um, before we do finally let you go, we're going to have a quick round of Play Your Apps right now. This is the game we've been playing on this show. We're going to start you off with a familiar former player and you're going to have to guess the number of Premier League appearances they've made. Now, this is Premier League appearances as per the PremierLeague.com website. I'll then give you another player and you need to tell me if that second player has made more or fewer appearances in a higher or lower format. Whoever's in charge at the end of the board after 11 players is our winner and it does tend to get a little bit harder as we go along. Our first player, and we're going to come to you first because you're both going to guess this, for what number of Premier League appearances according to PremierLeague.com does Ian Holloway have? Let's start with you, Chris. Ooh. What, as a manager? As a player. Or a player? Oh, um, I'm going to go with 
35. What are you going with, Nathan? I think it was a single season too, so that's quite a nine. I'll, hmm. It was more teams back then, so I'll say 42. 42. Wait, no. Yeah, 42, yeah. 42 against 38. He's actually 107. Wow. He uh, all, all, made, all made for QPR between 1992 yeah. and 1996, which, Nathan, that gives you control of the board. Do you want to Do you want to take us away or do you want to pass it over to Chris? And see I think how it's he gets easier on? to go second, but in the interest of fairness, I'll go first. Okay, all right. So Ian Holloway's... Well, that's, that's a noble choice. And <laughs> should, should we reverse at any point, I will offer you the same courtesy. <laughs> the winner of this gets a free drink. Love deal, it. deal. There is something at stake. So, is our next player higher or lower in Premier League appearances than Ian Holloway's 107? Our next player is Seamus Coleman. Oh, higher. Higher is correct. 329 at the beginning of 22-23 with his breakthrough campaign coming in 10-11 in the Premier League following that loan spell at Bloomfield Road in your promotion season. Our next player is James Beatty. Is he higher or lower than Seamus Coleman's 329? He's higher, higher. Higher. It is higher. 331 appearances, the final nine of which came in a tangerine shirt via Blackburn, <laughs> Southampton, Everton and Stoke. He scored 91 Premier League goals, but none for, none for Blackpool. Blackpool. Yeah. None for Blackpool. So you still could retain control of the board, Nathan. Uh, our next player is Brett Emerton. Is is Brett Emerton higher or lower than James Beatty? Did, he, did he play for Wigan? If it's who I think it is, how many is... I'm going to say lower. It is lower. 247 appearances. He appeared in nine consecutive Premier League seasons for Blackburn yeah. between 03 or 04 and 11 12. So you you retain control of the board, Nathan. I can do this, next, you, this is it. This I mean, Chris could come in right at the end. Uh, our next player is Jermaine Defoe. Higher or lower okay. than. For, uh, it is. It's four hundred ninety-six. Yeah. The thing is, I I would have. I think I would have got all of these. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Jermaine Defoe is higher than Brett Emerton. Four hundred ninety-six. The first uh, being in two thousand two thousand and one for West Ham. The last at Bournemouth in twenty eighteen nineteen. He joined the one hundred club in the intervening years with two spells at Spurs, two at Portsmouth, and also Sunderland. So Jermaine Defoe's four ninety-six is our next player higher or lower? Sol Campbell. Long career, but he went down to uh, 496, you say. Mm-hmm. So we're 38 times, 10 years. They can't, it's got... Oh. I'll go higher. This is a bit mental, but I'm going to go higher. You are not- correct oh, to go oh. higher. 503 appearances across the first 19 Premier League seasons for Spurs, Arsenal, Portsmouth and Newcastle. If only I was as good at anything else in life as I am at this game. <laughs> Our next player after Sol Campbell's 503 is Kevin Campbell. Oh, this is before my time. Uh, they probably played about 20 years back then. Uh, I'll go yeah. lower though. It is lower. 325 Premier League appearances. He scored in 14 of the first 15 Premier League seasons for Arsenal, Forest, Everton yeah. and West Brom. Has 83 Premier League goals to his name. You are four from the end, Nathan. What? This could be our first ever clean sweep at this stage. So Kevin Campbell's 325 appearances. I'm, I'm so nervous. Right. <laughs> our next player is DJ Campbell. Is he higher yeah. or lower than Kevin Campbell's 325 appearances? Uh, lower. He was lower. It is lower, 53 for yeah. Birmingham, Blackpool and QPR. Is our next player higher or lower than 53 appearances? Ian Evert. Oh, come on. No worry, he only played one season. Yes, he did. Lower, 42 oh, okay. appearances. Be- before, before being an ever-present for Blackpool, he made four appearances for Derby County in the early oh. 2000s. Ah. Do you know what this is like? This is like going up to the Snooker World Championships... A breaking against Ronnie O'Sullivan. That's what this feels like. <laughs> Just sat watching a one four seven happening. I'm going. I'm, I'm off. I'm done. <laughs> You are two from the end, Nathan. <laughs> Not to forget, just just to clarify the rules, that if Nathan gets this wrong on the very final one, you do win by default, Chris. So that pint is still on. Ian Everts, 42 appearances. Is our next player higher or lower? Brett Ormerod. That's interesting, because he played for Southampton before Blackpool, but he, he didn't play that long. And he didn't get many appearances for Blackpool. He came off a bench a few times. I'm going to go higher. It is... Higher, 99 oh. appearances. 99. Okay, first of all. Oh. Eight, 
80 of those came for Southampton between 2001 and 2005. He added a further 19 appearances on his return to Blackpool, mostly from the bench, scoring against Spurs. Chris, you have Carl, if this next one's Wayne Rooney, I am going to come over there and kick your ass. You understand that, right? (laughs) You, you, You now have to sit and watch the final black, Chris, as Nathan steps up to the table. Brett Olmerod's 99 appearances, our final player. Is he higher or lower? Andy Reid. Oh. That is higher, and I'll take my beer. Thank you very much, Chris. You would have gone higher as well, Chris? Of course he's higher. I would have gone every single one of the night. (laughs) (laughs) Andy Reid is higher. 115 appearances. He's only got 16 more Premier League appearances than Brett Do you know what? That does surprise me, actually. Yeah, I'd have thought it was higher than that. That is a shock. I think you should apologise to Carl, Chris. (laughs) Never. (laughs) Never apologise. Never explain. (laughs) The the one thing we've ascertained on this show is that Chris is not apologising to any Carls for the rest of his life. (laughs) (laughs) He's had his fill of Carls. Andy yeah, but Reed. I like you. Spell <laughs> <laughs> differently. You know. It is. That's true. That's true. It is a C. It is a C. Rings. Oh, this is a bit of a... Well, I'll go on. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Nathan. You win. Play your apps right. The pie is yours. Uh, gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for sharing. All. Firstly, Chris, where can people find you on social media and stuff like that if you want to be found for your Blackpool musings? Oh, I'm everywhere at carpet underscore Martin. That's where you'll find me. I am uh, the, the the British Comedy Guide re- uh, call me an actor, writer, director, and producer. Uh, what the British Comedy Guide do not call me is a comedian, and that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I feel I feel like that's gone on a long list of things that are okay and all right. That's uh... <laughs> I accept my lot in life, Carl. This is it. Can't change it. Can't, I mean, I could change it, but I'm, I just can't be asked. <laughs> and Nathan, we are going to chat about it in a bonus episode in a little bit more detail. But I have it here. Your fantastic book. Tell us a little bit about where people can find this. I think you can get it. Hey, Chris has gone. Hey. <laughs> I've got it as well. How not to win a football club? It's available. Uh, Waterstones, W. H. Smith, Foils, Amazon. Get it online. You can get it in store in Blackpool at, at Waterstones. If you look at Amazon, I think the reviews speak for itself. It's done the job. Like I'm very happy with how people have, have liked it. So it is the most definitive, comprehensive tale of the most batshit mental football club that you'll ever read. Genuinely know a lot of people who know nothing about football, certainly know nothing about Blackpool, who read many, like, have read many pages and put the book down and said, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. And that is um, a testament to the story of Blackpool FC more than my writing. It's uh, a crazy team. And you've probably heard some snippets of it in this podcast and there is a lot more in the book because a lot of people talk to me and I think they might have regretted it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're gonna we're gonna have a a, a little bonus snippet episode uh, talking about it in more detail as well. But it is a fantastic book. Having read it myself, it's absolutely brilliant. So, uh, congratulations on managing to to capture, as you say, what was a was a crazy time. Thank you both so much for joining me. That is Blackpool forty eight on the all time Premier League table. Join us again next time. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. So that was Chris and Nathan and Blackpool in 48th place. We were recording that for close to two hours and both of them came off saying they felt exhausted, quite frankly, just reliving it all. The kind of rage and anger that had maybe been suppressed a little bit, a little bit of water has passed under the bridge now, but reliving all of that. And it is a frankly unbelievable story. I cannot recommend Nathan's book highly enough. Obviously, if you're a Blackpool fan, it is must read. But if you are a general football fan, it is a cautionary tale as to what can happen if your football club falls into the wrong hands. They've got it back now. And you may have picked up, I mean, we recorded that back in January. Blackpool uh, have had a fantastic result this last weekend as we record this. We don't tend to do too much bang up to the minute stuff here, but Blackpool have had a brilliant result. Hopefully they will retain their place in the championship. The great escape is hopefully on. They are back under ownership that care about that football club. And I'm sure brighter days are ahead. Let's face it, it couldn't have got much darker as we covered in the show. Get Nathan's book. It is brilliant. Next week's show is a return to the deserted island matches format. I have viral comedy superstar Josh Pugh. He is 
one of the funniest comedians out there. He's going to be a big star. I've no doubt about it. He is a wonderful comedian, a great guy. He's an international footballer. More details on that next week's show as well. We talk about all of that, his love of David Beckham, his being a neutral fan. He's never kind of had a team thrust upon him, so he doesn't have a specific team that he really cares about, and we talk about the the kind of pros and cons of that as well. Josh Pugh is on the show next week. In the meantime, please keep passing the pod. Please leave a review. Please share it with a like-minded fan. If you're a Blackpool fan and you are joining today for the first time, hang around. I will have more Blackpool content to come and pass it on to other Blackpool fans who can hopefully get involved in the group therapy that has been this week's recording. But for now, I will be back again next week with Josh Pugh for a Deserted Island Matches special. I hope to see you back here then. See you next week. Thanks for listening to When Football Began Again. Join us again next time for another slice of Premier League nostalgia. In the meantime, subscribe, leave us a five-star review, find us on socials, and spread the word with all your Premier League-loving mates. Thanks.